Hello, welcome to Chapter 7, Late Baroque Instrumental Music, and there is a lot of nice music in this chapter. During the course of the Baroque era, the orchestra starts to gradually resemble something more like the modern orchestra. The Renaissance instruments gradually fell out of favor. That's why sometimes in our recordings you see of opera orchestras in the Baroque, you'll see somebody sitting with a lute with a very long neck. That's one of the or orchestra instruments more from the Renaissance. It didn't just happen overnight. An orchestra, remember, is an ensemble of musicians organized around a core of strings with added woodwinds and brasses playing with the assistance of a leader. And it's much smaller than the modern orchestra. Instrumental music became prominent in the 17th century with the rising popularity of the violin. The harpsichord was used for uh, assisting in the bass line along with one of the bass instruments, often the, the cello would outline the bass line along with the harpsichord. Gradually we have additions of pairs of woodwinds, occasionally trumpets and timpani, sometimes French horns. The reason why there's just a little sampling of winds in any given early Baroque orchestra is because it was difficult to get everybody to play in tune together. There were technical problems that had not been solved yet with these developing instruments. This is a modern Baroque orchestra on the right. You can see it's not an enormous group of musicians. It might be anywhere from a dozen to three dozen members unless it was for one of the rare large works of that era. In France, King Louis XIV was a big patron of the arts, and it was for self-glorification. He needed a soundtrack for his drama, and he was a self-proclaimed uh, sun king, and this outfit on the right is actually a drawing of him wearing an actual costume that he wore out in public at least once. And the message of absolutism, which was his style of leadership, was I am the state. I am the embodiment of a state. And he even thought of himself as nearly a god in some ways. Versailles was the largest court in history, and you can see a drawing of it on the left. It featured elaborate palace and gardens and outlying buildings. Something this grand had to have the proper music. King Louis XIV reigned for 72 years. He started very young and he had a long life. Music was a way the king showed his importance. The French overture was developed by his main court composer Lully. The use of the French overture epitomized the majesty and splendor of the court. The stately dotted rhythm pattern, long, short, long, short, was perfect for his choreographed processional arrival to performances at Versailles. This was always after guests were in place and part of the pageantry of court occasions and performances. Let's hear a little tidbit from a French overture performed on the keyboard in this case. Listen to the rhythm.
long, short long, long, short long. So it has a lot of dotted rhythms, which if you're a musician, means notes that are added length notes followed by shorter notes. Dum, ba bum, ba bum, long, short, long, short, long. That is a French overture. Louis the Fifteenth was Louis the Fourteenth's grandson, and instead of listening to music by Lully, who was employed by his grandfather, Louis the Fifteenth employed a composer named Jean Joseph Mouret. Moray wrote a rondo from the Suite de Symphonie featuring the trumpet. It's possible that you may have heard this piece before. It features idiomatic writing for the trumpet. Idiomatic writing is one of our vocabulary phrases for this unit. The Baroque era was the time when writing for specific instruments became common. This piece exploits the bright, fanfare-like quality of the trumpet. So let's take a listen to it. Sorry, I'm having trouble waking this up. We have organ playing accompanying it this this version. This is a Baroque style performing space. It's a cathedral. Features a lot of decoration to the architecture. Lots of added embellishments to the details, such as the cherub playing the horn up in the detail you saw up there. pipe organ. Take a look at all the filigree decorating the plaster behind the trumpet player. This was used for a masterpiece theater theme song. Perhaps some of you are old enough to remember it, as I am. Johann Pachelbel is another Baroque composer who was not alive all the way to the end of the era, but sort of in the second half of it. And he was born in southern Germany and began his musical studies there. He moved to Vienna, a very big music center, in 1671, where he was a student and deputy organist at the Imperial Chapel. He later worked as a court and church musician composer. He wrote over 200 pieces for organ, 100 fugues, and over 500 vocal works. Pachelbel was the organ teacher for Johann Christoph Bach. That's the older brother and the only known teacher of Johann Sebastian Bach. So we can see how important Johann Pachelbel was for J.S. Bach's development later. He used idiomatic writing also, musical composition that exploits the strengths of a particular voice or instrument. 
I know that's the second time I've given you that definition, but I'm hoping it's starting to soak in. It's an important one in this chapter. All of these late Baroque composers we are studying were masters of the idiomatic writing mentioned. Pachelbel's Canon in D major is played by three violins all in the same range. The low strings and organ, in, it can also be played by other keyboard instruments, play a plodding basso continuo in this version. You'll hear the organ. Basso continuo has pleasing intervallic pattern, fourths alternating with steps. So remember, it takes two people to play basso continuo, a bass instrument that plays one note at a time usually, like a cello or it could be a lute or a guitar or a bassoon, and the harpsichord or other keyboard instrument. So before the other instruments come in, we have the bass line, and I know this bass line very well. I've played this so many times. I, mean, I can't sing it in the bass, but I can sing it starting up here. Bum, here's a fourth down, up a step, down a fourth, up a half step, down a fourth up a fourth, up a whole step, up a fourth again. These are all perfect fourths, which sound like, here comes the bride. Let's hear this performance, or at least part of it. You're going to hear it in other materials for this week. It's a small organ. They also have a lute playing along with the cello. So three people playing basso continuo in this version, not typical. Notice how the lady in the middle has her hand up on the bow past the frog or the normal part where we would hold it. That was typical performance practice for the Baroque era. Can you hear the repeated bass line? Bum, 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 and so forth. Each violin is imitating the first violin part and they begin at two measure intervals. And it all fits together like clockwork. I often feel like uh, Paco Bell would be surprised at the popularity of this canon today. It's a perennial favorite any time I play out in public I'm asked to play it. And it's played for so many weddings and uh, occasions that are festive. And um, just for fun, we're going to hear from a frustrated former cellist about the Pachelbel Canon. This is comedian and musician Rob Paravonian. It's called the Pachelbel Rant. <laughs> I'm going to leave you with this little story It's about this piece of music It's a very popular piece of music I'm sure you all know it But I'll sing the melody right now Just... Yeah, Pachelbel's Canon in D It's a big hit in the classical world And I know this because I'm a geek I know what you're thinking It's like, Rob, you can't be a geek You play guitar, you're so cool Okay, you weren't thinking that, but I was. Um, well, I haven't always been this cool because I haven't always played guitar. I started out on the cello. Yeah, cello is a wonderful, beautiful instrument. It's a cool to be an adult that plays a cello. Being a kid that played the cello sucked. Because there's no way to be cool when your instrument is larger than you. When you walk to school with the cello, you're like a wounded gazelle on the Serengeti. Man. The bullies just smell you coming from a mile away. 
Ooh, I don't know what that thing is, but I know I'm going to break it. <laughs> but I put up with all of the abuse because I love the music that we played. I loved everything we played in orchestra, except this. I hate Pachelbel's Canon in D with a passion. I hate it so much because the cello part is the worst cello part ever written in the history of cello parts. It's eight quarter notes that we repeated over and over again. They are as follows. D, A, B, F sharp, G, D, G, A. And that's all we got to play. We repeated those eight notes 54 times. I counted. Because I had nothing else to do. I would sit back and listen to the violins get lovely melodies. The violas would get lovely melodies. The second violins would get lovely melodies, which should just not happen. And the cello, we got stuck with eight crappy, lousy, stinking notes. And I began to wonder why. Why would Pachelbel do that to us? Such a beautiful instrument. And my theory was he once dated a cellist. And she dissed him really bad. And so for the rest of his life, he came up with the worst cello parts he could ever think of. And it wouldn't be so bad if I didn't hear him every day. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Rob, don't listen to classical radio anymore. I, it doesn't matter. Pachelbel's following me. It sounds paranoid, but he's following you too. You hear him every day. I don't know. I went to my step-nephew-in-law's eighth grade graduation, and their graduation song was a song by Vitamin C. No. As we go on, we'll remember. La da 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 It's on the drive home. I turned on some classic rock, some Aerosmith. There was a time when I was so broken hearted. La da 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 da. So I got home, I thought I'd clear my mind with some folk music. No. Listen, children, to my story. It was written long ago. They do Paca Bell just like everybody does Paca Bell, just to torment me. I don't even go to Taco Bell anymore because it sounds too close. <laughs> I hate Pachelbel with a passion. I don't even know his first name. It's probably Johan. They're all named Johan. When you think about it, he's the original one-hit wonder. You can look up the Pachelbel rant on YouTube if you would like to hear the end of it, but you can hear that he was just playing the same chord progression over and over that matched all of these surprisingly modern songs that we know of. Now we move on to another composer, wonderful composer, Vivaldi. And he is famous for the Baroque Concerto. He wrote over 400 concertos in his lifetime. What is a concerto? Looks like the word concerto, but like cello, we add a, a ch sound since the C is followed by an E. And this is Italian. So, it's an instrumental genre in which one or more soloists play with and kind of opposing or against a larger orchestra. I wouldn't call it like a smackdown way of against, but in, in uh, a, a kind of dance. There's a, three different major kinds of concertos. So it's the solo concerto featuring one soloist, the Concerto Grosso, which is a small group of soloists. We call that group the Concertino. And why not Concertino? But I guess we're saying it in English. And then Tutti is uh, the full orchestra. So actually, we're talking about two different concertos. Sorry, I was looking at the list. Tutti means that uh, it, when we have a Concerto Grosso, the small group of soloists is called the Concertino. And then when the full orchestra plays, that's called the tutti. So two different kinds of concertos. There's also sometimes concertos for two solo instruments, but we won't get into that. They feature three movements or separate parts. And the scheme is almost always fast, slow, fast for the three parts. In the Baroque era, the ritornello form is used for the fast movements. The main theme is called the ritornello, and it returns again and again, alternating with the solo and virtuosic sections performed usually by the soloist. The popularity peaked about 1730 of the Baroque concerto, and the solo concerto continued to be cultivated during the classical and romantic period, and we still have concertos being written today they became a showcase for a single soloist eventually. 
The characteristics of a ternular form are in this little schematic drawing. All or part of the main theme returns over and over. So, so here we have the ritonello and the solo, the ritonello, the solo, and so on till we get to the final ritonello. And then the group that plays these things are the very first time we hear the tutti, everybody plays. Oops. Then the solo plays and um, sometimes the concertino if it happens to be a a concerto grosso and then tutti always comes in and plays the ritornello and the actual numbers of alternations are determined by the composer and the piece so let's look at a little bit more detail the three movements of the baroque concerto a movement is a self-contained section of a larger work if you ever go to hear a group perform all three movements of a concerto it is customary to wait until the end of all three movements for the audience to clap the fast first moment is serious in tone and it uses the ritornello form the second movement is slow and usually has a free form and the third movement is fast again often a rustic dance-like character a little bit lighter perhaps than the first movement in mood and it features the ritornello form again here's a group of musicians again from a baroque orchestra let's look a little bit closer at the life of Antonio Vivaldi he was born in 1678 died in 1741 he was Italian a virtuoso violinist himself and he was known as the red priest he had red hair and began his career as a priest and suffered from we think asthma his entire career he was known to have some weaknesses with his health and the fact that he had a relatively long life belies the fact that he did have some kind of an ongoing issue and it is what led him to give up the priesthood although some people think he gave up the priesthood because he was just more interested in focusing on being a musician he worked at the Hospital de la Pieta the Hospital of Mercy for nearly 40 years of this long career and he taught music lessons there and conducted the orchestra he became the music director eventually and began composing concertos for his students this hospital of mercy was an orphanage and private school for girls it was quite unusual for anything at the time the all-female orchestra gave weekly concerts with the orchestra seated behind a screen to shield the young ladies from prying eyes it was not if you will remember it was not appropriate for women in catholic countries to appear on a stage and to sing so how did they happen to have an orchestra they were in their own kind of a almost like a convent it wasn't a religious organization but they were sequestered in their own performing space and the public was invited in and the screen was used to keep uh, modesty a part of this and to protect the girls at the time seems kind of odd to today by our standards Vivaldi wrote more than 450 concertos toward the end of his life he, you can see he died in 1741 and his job at the hospital of the Pieta ended in 1740 so he only lived a year after that he was banished from all Catholic countries late in his life and fired from this job due to an unmarried liaison with a soprano a French opera singer actually and he I think she was a court singer he died while visiting Vienna looking for work we talk about a little bit about the the different opposing forces in the Baroque greater freedoms yet society still had rigid rules so 
Here is a man who had a rather bohemian lifestyle and lived with a woman he wasn't married to, but eventually, even though it happened much later in his life, eventually this caught up with him and he was fired from his job. Let's talk a little bit more in detail about this orphanage in Venice. It became famous as a music school for girls. It was such a wonderful school that some nobles pretended their legitimate daughters were orphans to gain entry for them, although this was discouraged highly. The ladies of the Pietà were always known by their instrument or voice. By far the most famous was Anna Maria del Violin, who was born in 1696 and trained by Vivaldi. She later became the maestra of the orchestra and took over Vivaldi's position when he left. So we can see on the right, lower right corner here, the facade of the Ospedal, which is still there, and more of a detail of it up close. And in the middle, we have an interesting and odd feature of the building. During this time, Venice was a big party town. Let's think of it as being somewhat like New Orleans in character. And it was a very popular place for wild partying, and there were many prostitutes who were, uh, who were employed, basically, by the demand of the nobles to go out and have, um, have relations outside of their marriages. And so these illegitimate children, which were before the age of birth control, typically uh, unwanted pregnancies were a typical part of the prostitute's life back then. And so when these children were, married, were born, excuse me, when the children were born, the fathers often did not recognize officially the fact that it was their child, but they would provide for the child by paying for them to be raised in one of these orphanages. So this is sort of how this happened. The orphans often were delivered to the Hospital de, de la Pieta through this little device. You can see a round place here and um, there was a mechanical crank here. It's no longer active, of course. And uh, so somebody could place a baby in here, turn the crank to turn it around and face the interior, and the baby would be safely inside the building. And then they would ring a bell and presumably hurry away from the building. And this was the way that anonymous foundlings were brought to the, to the orphanage. One of the most famous concertos by Vivaldi is a concerto, a group of them actually, called The Seasons. And Opus 8 number 1 is called The Spring, Primavera, and it was the first of the four concertos that, as a title together, are known as The Seasons. These were published in 1725. Vivaldi wrote an illustrative sonnet or poem for each one, that kind of evoke what he was thinking about. Each concerto evokes the feelings, sounds, and sights of the season it is named after. Hence, we would call this a programmatic sort of piece. In autumn, he specifies the violas are to sound like barking dogs at one point. And as I said before, this is Vivaldi's best known composition. We can see a portrait of him on the right. We don't see his characteristic red hair because he's wearing a cost customary wig from the time. The meter of the first part of the spring is duple, and the texture is mostly homophonic. This means there's one melody that's supported by chords from the orchestra. The form is the ritonello format that we talked about. It has a bright, optimistic feel to it, and sounds of spring are featured. At one point, not very far in, we hear the songbirds and violins chirping. There's a stream running in 16th notes, do -de -do -de -de -do -de -do -do -de do -de -do -de later on. And then a thunderstorm featuring tremolo, where the musicians shake their bows at the tip, and then very fast scales, so are supposed to represent thunder and lightning. 
I'm sorry, don't worry about this listening guide. I meant to take it out of here. It's from an older edition of the book. So let's go into hearing this. Oh dear, why does this not work? I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go further down here to find it. Um, let's see. I hope that I'm I hope that I can make this link active. Yes. I love this performance. It's very unique. It's not a live performance. It's a film performance. From Wales. It has a lot of elements of nature in it. And they play inside a dome. Ritornello and a very good little group called Academy of St. Martin's in the Fields. It's the first solo section sounding like chirping birds. And there's a solo section. Here's the murmuring brook. Here's the tremolo. Scales, thunderstorm, solo section. Another solo section. And back to the ritornello. Now this is just the first movement of it, and if you want to hear the whole thing, you can do a search on that. This is the movement that is featured in our textbook. So that is it. That is all for this chapter. Enjoy working through the activities and the active listening guides for it.